All right, so I'm sure everybody is, well, a lot of people came from the East Coast, so it's probably like lunchtime. But first thing in the morning, we're gonna be talking about licensing, which is always like a fun thing to start these conferences with. These are just pictures of different kinds of licenses, I guess. Um, so OpenStreetMap is in ODBL. Um, it used to be in Creative Commons at one point. They switched it over because Creative Commons didn't work very well with databases, but um, ODBL is supposed to be better. Uh, oops, that's the wrong direction. Uh, there was a push, I think this was 2012, to get rid of ODBL and move at least some stuff to public domain or at least um, get rid of the share alike. And that kind of failed because, well, there were some, there's some benefits to having this share alike involved so people can't just take OpenStreetMap data and put in their own products. Uh, but in the end, it turned out that OpenStreetMap's license is actually pretty good for what OpenStreetMap does. Uh, I think that the companies that were really interested in this kind of moved on to different products, different ways of doing things. And we didn't really need an open license change. But there are other kinds of licenses, like public domain is very important for the government. Everything that the government is releasing, at least should be in public domain. This is a little quote that I found on it from Wikipedia, but the, the main thing, the main point is that most things should be in public domain. There are some exceptions, and you can trademark data, and, trademark pictures and stuff. But for the most part, it should be in public domain. So that kind of creates a situation where um, we can't just use OpenStreetMap data within government and passing data back to OpenStreetMap is kind of a one-way street. Um, I wrote a thing on this a while ago, 2013, I think, that just kind of goes over the specifics. And it gets really into like, Topography, I try to put a picture here of topography and linking. But once a node in one of the ways connects to a different way, that way becomes licensed by ODBL. So if you just connect your road to the one next to it, that could be a problem. And I, I work for the National Park Service, and we have this problem a lot at our, our boundaries of the parks because we use OpenStreetMap data on all of our maps outside the parks, but inside the parks, we use our own government data. And there's alignment issues, and we can't take our point and just line it up to OpenStreetMap because then our data becomes licensed. And we really shouldn't be taking OpenStreetMap data and moving it to government data because there's some reason OpenStreetMap put it there. Our data could have different data quality standards, uh, but we shouldn't be editing their data just to match ours unless we're really making a focused effort to do that as a wholesale thing. So the other thing with government data support is it needs to be, or at least is expected to be, authoritative. So that means that someone comes to look at a park service boundary, and especially in, in the park service, we don't allow hunting in the parks. So people use those maps as legal definitions, or, or try to use them as legal definitions of where the, the boundary is so they can decide where to hunt and where not to hunt. And these have come up in legal issues. But because of that, they're very afraid of allowing just someone to come in and move uh, a point somewhere because for legal reasons, somebody can move the boundary over and say, hey, now I can use this land for whatever I want to use it for. So. We can't just take in OpenStreetMap data into the government anyway, despite the license. Uh, and here's something that Greg is here nodding. I think Greg may have made this at one point. 12 years ago. 12 years ago, but. Uh, so the USGS has been working on this probably since like the 70s, the whole taking information, setting up maps to municipalities having them send the data back as you know, marked up maps, bring it in, having it get validated, having it go through this whole process, and showing up eventually in the US Topo products. Uh, this process has been refined and refined over years and has kind of gotten to the point where it's 
uh, a little bit easier to automate. There's still a lot of steps involved, but they have moved through various platforms. I think they're using an Esri-based platform right now, but the idea is you take a volunteer contributions, you go through a process of vetting. Uh, I think this one is currently three-tiered. You have the, uh, the people in the field that are collecting, you have the like states, and then you have the federal level. And there's data stewardship levels like that. And, and it's a really good process. And here's me talking about this like 10 years ago. Um, and it's pretty much the same thing as now. I just wanted to put that in there and be like, this isn't anything new. So I found a public domain image of forks from a museum. So that's what this is. So I want to talk a little bit about forks and why I actually don't like Forks. I wrote a paper on why it's not very good. Um, also, 10 years ago, because everything's old now. Um, but when you fork a database, what you're basically doing is taking everything in it and saying, OK, this is mine now, and then this is the other one. So anything you add to this one doesn't show up on this side. And if you want to keep it you know, going back and forth, that's really cool. But that's really hard to do. and. Uh, a good example that I was thinking of for this was in the park service, we have campgrounds. And we have a point in the middle of the campground. But some parks would like to camp individual campsites instead of just the campground. Or others will put one pin and say, there are 10 sites here. So when you're trying to conflate data like that, it's really it's not just a difference of opinion. It's a difference of ways of, of representing the same thing. And that really becomes a lot harder. So there are other forks out there. Uh, I could not actually find this Creative Commons fork that back when the ODBL license came in, there was a group that split off and said, we're going to stay Creative Commons. I don't know if that still is around. Uh, the National Map Corps, which I had talked about from the USGS, uh, there was a project that I worked on at the NPS called Places. We kind of rolled that together with some other products. Uh, it's still, we still have the data, but the we were able to merge that back into our bigger data set, which was actually a cool process, I think. And uh, Open Historical Map has a lot of sessions going on this week. And their stuff's really cool, and they have their own fork. There are other ones. I didn't look them all up. Uh, anyway, so I want to present a new fork after I mentioned I don't like them, right? <laughs> So the point of this is that everything will be in the public domain license. So anybody can just put whatever they want in. Anybody can take whatever they want. It's, it's fine. The, the point here, the final data set can, can be used for federal databases and OpenStreetMap. Uh, and this is something else Greg worked on. He's the, the workflow guy. Uh, this really just kind of goes through the steps. I'm not really sure how much of this is readable. Uh, but it goes through the steps that everything goes in. We collect data. It goes through a vetting process, the authoritative review. That can go out to the government database directly. Or we can use something like MapRoulette is, is a tool that we've used a lot just in the past. And we really like that. But we have been looking at everything else that we can use. Um, so our pilot project is railroad tunnels. This is actually an old highway tunnel. But uh, there was a tunnel I could find that I had a picture I took, so yeah. So this is using uh, railroad data. And we already have the, the railroad segments. I'm going too slow, I guess. This is hard. So this has, we already have railroad segments, but we want to add tunnels to it. So let's see. This is the process, basically. I'm going to go through these fast. So you find your tunnel. You, and I'm sure everybody here is familiar with ID. You split the way. And you create a new segment. And then you tag it as a tunnel. So next steps. We really want to get this pilot. This is just in Colorado right now. We want to expand it. Uh, we're, we're still going through the tasking manager, trying to figure out the best way to keep people involved, keep people knowing what's going on with, with which step. And it's, it's a little confusing in there. And I think that is kind of a holdup for us. Let's see what else did I say in here. 
Oh yeah, we want to go into trail data at some point. That is something that I'm really interested in because I'm sure you looked at the schedule and you see there's a trails working group, which is a big project that I've been working on for a while. And I've just been part for a while. And everybody here, a lot of people here have been working on it. And that's really cool. And I would love to see this getting our trail data out there. Um, I threw another thing here of a conflation project I did with Map Roulette probably not that long ago, 2015. It's only seven years ago. But we've been working on this stuff for a while, trying to come up with ways to get this stuff back into OpenStreetMap and trying to keep the government and the uh, OpenStreetMap community together. Uh, this is mostly kind of a volunteer project. Like We get a little bit of funding from government agencies, but a lot of it is volunteered. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that we need help with, but we mostly just need people to help map. All right, and that's all I got. I have thanks to a lot of people who have been working on these and meeting with us every week or every other week, at least on calls. So thanks everybody who helped out, and um, I'll answer questions, and Daryl's going to get up here and answer any questions, too. <laughs>